Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to our nine o'clock combined service for January. We're combining the eight o'clock, the 10 o'clock and the 5 o'clock, so there may be um, elements from any or all of those services in, in this service. A very warm welcome to the cathedral, um, a welcome to those who are joining us online, and my name is Jeremy, Jeremy Rice, like fried rice, and I'm the hospital chaplain and it's my privilege to lead. Mike was to be leading, Mike Wellham, our assistant minister, but unfortunately he's gone down with a tummy bug. He's back, but that came on last night. So apologies from Mike, he would have loved to have been here with you. Please stay if you can after the service for um, a cup of tea or coffee, some informal fellowship, something to eat uh, over in, in the hall behind the cathedral. Um, so we're going to our first slide now. The Lord be with you. Thank you very much. Uh, our special focus this year is, is to be um, reaching people for Christ. I think for reach, build and live. And this year it's reach. Reaching people for, for Jesus. And there will be a, an interview um, after our, our, our first hymn of Marjorie. Maybe some, some tips, Marjorie, on, on welcoming people, uh, inviting people uh, to the cathedral. So uh, the, the theme today, um, why, Lord? Uh, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself when something's happened, why? Why, Lord? And in Psalm 73, the psalmist, um, he um, moves from self-pity, he just feels like giving up, why, why? And uh, to uh, coming into the presence of the Lord, confession, a, a confession of how he was feeling, and then an exquisite declaration of faith, uh, and then wanting to declare from self-pity to declaring the wonderful works that God has done. So our verse of the day, which comes from Psalm 73, but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of your works. Our first hymn, um, opening hymn, uh, Thank you, Rachel, and, 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 and the choir. So we sing of the power and the mercy and the glory and the love and the purity uh, of, of our great God and Father. Let, let us sing holy, holy, holy. Please stand if you're able. Words on the screens.
Would you please be seated? We now have um, an interview of, of Lachlan, our dean, more, more about Lachlan uh, and what he's been up to conferencing later, but uh, with Marjorie. Uh, so please, let's watch the video. Marjorie, as you know, we're uh, uh, particularly focusing on reach this year yes. for the cathedrals, part of our threefold mission plan, reach, build and live. Yes. And this year we're keen for our church to be reaching Geraldton for Jesus. And uh, when Songs of Praises have been on over the last couple of years, I've noticed your eagerness to use as an opportunity to invite the community into our church. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen you have had a particular method of making sure that you invite people. And so I wonder if you might be able to share with people what the steps are that you have uh, in going about inviting friends, contacts, family members, all that sort of thing. Um, I think first of all, it has to be that we are passionate about it. So I have a passion for sharing the gospel of Jesus mm. um, with the Midwest community. Mm. That started about uh, 1978 when I came to Geraldton. First time I knew that uh, we could have a personal relationship with God. And uh, a couple of years after I came here, um, I gave my life to Jesus. And the experience of that, um, just um, having the peace of God within me that passes all understanding, I just want everybody to have, okay? So my method was to look back and think about um, the people who, what I call, are lapsed Anglicans, people that used okay. to come to our church, yeah. who have dropped out, or for some reason or other, or gone to other churches, it didn't matter. There are also people that <coughs> um, I've met in hospital, I used to do hospital visiting every Monday for about 30 years, and pe the few people there I'd formed quite a close relationship with, and I felt I knew them well enough to invite them. Uh, people from my veterinary clinic, mm. um, that uh, clients that I had, um, established really good friendships with they went with but in order that we got it all together I had a little list like uh, I think Coco and the Mikado had a little list he was the chief executioner um, but anyway <laughs> I actually had an exercise book and there were, ended up about five pages now the trouble with that is um, how do you uh, actually invite people so so this is a list of names, this is isn't it? This is names, but it had to be redone because people, people right. change address and stuff. Wow. But the initial list was five pages, okay. Um, so my decision was to, um, I wrote a little handwritten letter, uh, which I got photocopied, but I was able to make it personal, my dear Nathan, my dear Lachlan, my dear whatever, and sign off. And then sometimes if I knew them well enough, I could put a little personal message at the end, and they thought it was really, really personal for them. So cheating a bit, but it, but it seemed to work. And then I would put it in the mails. So it takes a while to work up a little list. Um, so I think it's actually better. So I used to mail these, put stamps mm. on them. Mm. People like getting letters in the mail. So that, that might be seen as an old fashioned thing now, but you think it's still important to do yes. that. But I think it's, it's more than just putting a flyer in an envelope, like mm. they, we'd get very good flyers with, mm. to put a personal message with it as well. So maybe a little mm. card and said, dear granny, I would just love if you were able to attend this service. Yeah. Um, I will come and collect you if you like. Um, it's at 10 o'clock on Sunday or whatever. Okay. Um, so I think it needs to be just more than handing out a flyer. Um, it needs to be the personal one-to-one -one invitation, whether it is by mail or whatever. Okay, so your experience with mail is people actually like, still like to receive a posted letter in their letterbox. They like it even more now because uh, they get them so seldom, mostly uh, emails, phone calls, texts, they don't get letters in the mailbox. Initially I think I sent out 120 invitations. Wow. Um, Maybe only 20 come, I've actually quite a lot more than that responded. Mm. But there's a lady who we know quite well, who I sent invitations to for about 12 years, and last year she thanked me for them, and she comes to our church regularly now and is very active. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, it just takes a little bit of self-discipline to do it. We put the names down as you think of them, starting right now, writing the names of Granny, your um, adopted aunt or aunt, uh, uncle, mm. um, you know, friends that you have coffee with from school, 
meeting with school people mm. and write them this, it doesn't do any harm sending an invitation. Mm. Mm. And mm. maybe even that will make them think about, oh, I haven't been to church for a long time. Mm. Even if, if they don't come to our church, that yes. they will return to their own church. Yes. So yes. it's wow. all about winning souls for God. <gasps> Marjorie, I think, I think you said when you write your invitation, it's not just please come, but you also added in something very important there. Uh, well, that you might need to be collected. Yes. yes. Yeah. So I, would, I wouldn't do that for everybody, okay. but um, the persons that I think might need collected that wouldn't have their own transport. Okay. But if, if you're only inviting 10, say, you could put that in and you could, if you can't bring them all yourself, yes. you, you could arrange other people to collect right, them. Right, right. So, very yeah, good. It's good. Come with me. Come with me. It's a good to check. Um, so the, the initial time that you did this, 120 invitations went out, and over the time you've got about 20 people say come. -ish. No, I actually got a lot more than that. Oh. Probably about 100. Yeah, came. Oh, all up. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh, that was from my from my invitations. Okay. Other people were inviting as well, and it was new, and we had a guest organist. Okay. Uh, so it, it was a, it was a really good show. I can't. We can't sort of take all the credit for that uh, yeah. because God works in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, That's yeah. true, isn't it? Um, quite often God is engaging with somebody who he's going to call to himself in more than one way. That's it. And, and Marjorie might be just one link in, in that picture, one yeah. piece of that puzzle, yeah. but you're being faithfully that piece of, 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 their, um, of their journey. Uh, so to come my along. journey to conversion really depended on a um, the dean's wife at that time who was just such a lovely Christian present mm. so she didn't Bible bash me she didn't quote anything I went to play group I got to know her she was kind to everybody but I could see in her the light of Christ that's what I recognized was different about her right. the light of Christ was shining through her so she was a catalyst although it was a different person was the sort of challenger that said Margie what are you going to do about it oh okay so you've been regularly coming to church then oh yes I've to have been churchy all my years. So I went from churchianity yeah. to Christianity. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So always been church attender, love going to church, love yeah. church music, love yeah. singing. Yeah. 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 But there was some point where something changed then. Well, I'd never heard about this personal relationship with God until right. I came to Geraldton. Right. Okay. And then I met this lady who was the catalyst. Jo her name is Joan. She's still my soul friend. And I could see in her something different, something that I needed to have that I didn't have. Okay. And it was, I think, the light of Christ shining through. Wow. Yeah. That's an important part of the step, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's one part of the step to be praying for your friends and family. Yes. It's another part to have the boldness to invite them along to an event. Yes. It's another part of the story to actually have those spiritual conversations, those Jesus conversations. And yet another part for somebody to challenge them and say, where are you at? Yeah. How, can, how can we help? What, what decision yeah. do you make? Yeah. And you might only be part, a small part of one of those sections yeah. of somebody's journey. Right. And either way, it's as you said, it's God's work. Yeah. But we have the joy yeah. of being able to be involved in that. So we have to be willing to participate mm. Um, mm. in that journey. Marjorie, thank you so much. Uh, I know you're such an encouragement to me. The importance of being organized and thinking, not only thinking, oh, there's a person I'd really like to introduce to Jesus, but writing their name down somewhere or other yeah. and doing the effort of inviting them, whether it be through a, a posted letter, a follow up with a phone call or an email and encouraging them and even an invitation that I'll come and pick you up. Yeah. Or you could, um, I don't know if you've done this, you could say, let's go out for an afternoon tea and after that we'll come along to the event. Or likewise, yeah. come to the event and then afterwards we'll go out for dinner yeah. together or something yeah. like that, yeah. that that creates that sort of yeah. engagement yeah. there. Thank you, Marjorie, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, and I, I hope that this is an encouragement for our church to think about how do we actively engage in this sort of stuff? What do we do? It just it won't come without us actively doing something about it. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. And, and, uh, I was going to say something like, um, we have to work at evangelism, even though we're, it's God, God that actually convicts, but we have to um, till the soil, maybe, mm. yeah, mm. so mm. The, the seed can be sown and, and the harvest mm. reaped.
Thank you very much, Marjorie and, and, and Lachlan. So that's really to spur us on and give us ideas with um, reaching people for Jesus. And Marjorie told a little bit of her Jesus story and that idea, especially that came through of, of writing letters and posting them, Australia Post, bringing uh, the invitation to people and offering to meet them and things like that. Now we go to um, the holiday edition of Cathedral Kids. And um, so children, would you like to come down the front to hear what's been happening to our friends in Gumtree Gully? Mm, I reckon this week you'll get down there a lot quicker than me. Because I'm coming from the back. Let's go. Do you guys know this song? My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. With actions, well done. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Well done. I seem to be pinging a little bit, I'm not quite sure why. So there was a really terrifying fire, wasn't there? It was devastating. It raged through Gumtree Gully, which is where we are. It burned hotter than the sun and it roared like a mighty engine. All the trees, all the greenery, everything was burnt. It's pretty sad, isn't it? Does anyone remember how it got to be like that? Yeah. Yeah? Yes, that's right. They, they didn't clean up the leaf litter, did they? So this guy here is the ranger, isn't he? And he's a bit like God. He'd created this beautiful place for the animals to live and he'd rescued them and put them there and he was looking after them. And, but he gave them a rule, didn't he, to clean up the leaf litter and they didn't do that. Now, he didn't give them a rule, did he, because he's mean and nasty and horrible. He gave them the rule because it was actually for their good, wasn't it? Because he loves them. But that's actually not what happened. So let's pick it up, let's see what's going on. So the animals were now standing beside the creek, looking at their black and smouldering bushland, feeling very thankful to be alive, but really sad too, because their beautiful home had been destroyed. So Rocky, and our friend Bluey, they actually went up to the ranger and said, thank you. Thank you for coming to save us. Thank you for risking everything so that we could be safe. But you know, some of the other animals, they'd forgotten about the rescue already. They were grumbling and they were complaining. So Sneaky sneered, look at it. It's all dead. What are we gonna do now? Curly was going, but hang on, I've got nowhere to sleep. What am I gonna do? And Jacko, he wasn't laughing so much anymore. He was saying, there's no food. Or there's, what are we gonna eat? There's no grass, there's no leaves. Even all the insects have been burned up. What are they gonna do? And good old Paddle, he was looking at his creek and saying, my home has been destroyed. We're all gonna have to leave. It's just all bad. What are we saved for? It's just all bad. But you know what? The ranger said to them, stop being so glum. This bushland will grow back again. Everything that is black and burnt today will be bursting with greenery within the next few months. For many of the trees and the plants, the ash and the soot actually feeds the soil and the rain will come. It'll actually feed everything with water and it will be fine. Sneaky sneered. What's burnt stays burnt, he said. Everyone knows that. My great uncle Sliver, he was once caught in a bushfire. He was burned to a crisp and that's how he stayed. These trees and these bushes, they're burnt just like Uncle Sliver. I tell you, gum tree gully, it's crispy. It's gonna stay burnt. There's no new life out of dead wood. So the ranger, he said quite quietly, but very seriously, now actually Sneaky, you are wrong. Within a few weeks, there will be new green shoots, 
tiny leaf buds, and within a few months, you won't recognise the place. There'll be new life bursting out of everywhere. Hmm. But what if you're wrong, complained Curly. Wise old wombat, he scratched his head and his hairy nose, and he said, well, I for one believe what the ranger says. If he says new life will grow out of the burnt and blackened bush, I believe him. Do you believe him? Do you reckon there's going to be regrowth? Or do you reckon it's going to stay dead? Regrowth, yeah. Well, guess what? He was right. Except I forgot one bit of the story. There's a problem, isn't there? What's going to happen in between now and then? They won't have any food, that is correct. So they're going to be worried about that, aren't they? And they were. Bluey said, but, but how can we stay? There's nothing to eat. The ranger said, I'm going to look after you. He said, I'll bring in hay, I'll bring in leaves. And he said to Jacko, I'll even catch some insects for you and bring them in. And he's going to clean out the creek for paddle. That's pretty generous, isn't he? After they've been doing all their complaining. All right. But you know what? Sneaky still sneered. Curly still looked really doubtful. And Jacko, he just laughed it off. How could new life come out of such a place that's so damaged and dead? But it turned out just as the ranger had said. He brought in supplies for the animals and they were fed and he cleaned out the creek. And within a few days, the rain came in and washed away the worst of all the ash and the dust and it refilled the creek. And it fed the plants. And within a few weeks, tiny green buds did start to appear. And within a few months, there was new green growth popping out of everywhere. doesn't want to stick. There we go. And do you know what? There was even beautiful coloured wildflowers that appeared. So one day, Rocky and Bluey, they were racing each other down the creek bank when Rocky suddenly stopped. What's the hold up, Bigfoot? Bluey asked. Have you tripped over your own toes? Of course not, replied Rocky. I'm very sure-footed. It's just that I suddenly remembered, that's all. Remembered what? His possum friend asked. Remembered what this place was like just after the big bushfire. Now it's all growing back, just as the ranger said it would. Bluey looked around and he said, it's amazing stuff, all right. New life out of the ashes. You know, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 33, God raised Jesus to life and he's taken him to a place of honour at his right hand. So this part of our story, this fresh new life out of the ashes, is a little bit like a picture of what God has done with Jesus. Because after Jesus died on the cross, he raised him to new life. So God, who's the source of all life, raised Jesus to life who is the bringer of new life to us. But now Jesus isn't still here, is he? Does anyone know where he is? What do you reckon, Chloe? He is in heaven, and he's actually at God's right hand. So he's gone back to heaven to be with his father. And what has God made him? Do you guys know? Made him the king. Yeah. King over the whole of the universe. And one day King Jesus is going to return. And at that time, for those that keep saying no to Jesus and keep saying no to God, there will be punishment. But the really, really, really good news is that for those who follow Jesus and say yes to him, he's going to take him, take all of us up to be in his perfected heaven forever. All right. Well done. Guess what? We've got one more part of the story for next week. But for now, we have a quiet activity to do. Now, again, you know, the adults, they're pretty good, aren't they? Do they make lots of noise when we're having our teaching time? So for our quiet activity, why, why do you reckon it needs to be quiet? Why do you reckon? 
it is their learning time. You are right, and it's time that we do prayer, and we've also got communion today, so it's a big service. So we've got two rules, don't we, for our quiet activity. One, we're going to try and keep quiet. Now, some of you are working on our activity together, and that's all good, but just remember, let's keep, keep it nice and quiet. And don't forget to, if you use something, don't forget to put it back and clean up your rubbish at the end, okay? And what are we doing? What are we making? Do you guys remember? A big board game, that's right. And there's only one rule, isn't there? Like for the animals, there was one rule. What's our one rule? Yes, staying quiet for the activity, but Chloe, yes. It has to be based on the story. Well done. You can make it however you like. You can make it 3D. You could be make it like another game that you love really lots. You could be really old school, because I'm old. And you could make a board game, except it's all sticky. So you can do whatever you like. So that's the one I've been working on. And I know you guys have been doing amazing work. There is some... Uh, things up the back there like counters for your little people to go around. There is dice, there is cardboard tubes, there is paper, there is scissors, there is whatever you would like. And next week, we're gonna make sure we've got some little boxes for you to put everything in for you to take home. Because by next week, we'll have them all finished. What do you reckon? All right. Now, um, especially this week, uh, this rule, be in line of sight of your parents, probably quite important because I'm not going to be up the back on this side because I'm up the back on that side behind the sound desk. So, let's go. Thanks, kiddos. Thank you very much, Beck, for leading the um, special holiday edition of Cathedral Kids. Oh, I see that Brett's there on the, on the changing over the slides. That'll, that, that'll be good. Um, so now I'm going to ask if um, you would join me in this prayer before we hear the Bible read to us. So it's a prayer before hearing God's word. So let's pray as uh, we, we hear God's word. And that's coming up now, so if you'd like to join me. Thank you, Father, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Lord, open our hearts to receive your word that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Marjorie is coming up now to read the, the first Bible reading. Um, it'll be from the New International Version rather than the ESV. Um, that's due to me. I prepared the sermon that's following in a few minutes um, from the New International Version. And I'll be covering the whole psalm, but here uh, I've asked Marjorie to read just a selection of the verses. So the words on the screens will match the words that Marjorie is reading to us from Psalm 73. Thank you. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. This is what the wicked are like. <clears throat> Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. 
Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Marjorie. Ray is coming forward to our next reading. We're in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus and his disciples. Tomorrow, Jesus is going to be crucified, and we're with him uh, watching as his agonized prayer, his steadfast love, and his sleepy disciples. Thank you. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew chapter 26, reading from the 36th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch, pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the Gospel of the Lord. A word of prayer. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for your great love for us. And we pray now that your, and always, that your word would be our rule, your spirit, our teacher, and your greater glory, our supreme concern. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I think I'm going to be um, using the remote to change the slides now, Jenny, but (laughs) I might need plan B. Well, I'm sure you have, but I'll ask the question anyway. Do you ever ask, why did God allow that to happen? And as you 
are aware of things going on around the world and things going on in your own life. Uh, people's lives cut heartrendingly short by disease or accident. News of hundreds of thousands dying in, in, in wars and um, famines around the world. H horrific crimes we read about nearly every day. And particularly, looking at Psalm 73, uh, situations of discouragement when evildoers get away with it. Maybe even envying them in some perverse way because of their success. Corruption in some governments, in some companies, in some councils, in other groups, or individuals even, think of dictators, but even in homes here and, and around the world. And people keep on getting away with it. You know, they flaunt it. Um, luxury cars, swanky mansions, extravagant lifestyles. Maybe there's nothing wrong in some of those things in moderation, but certainly not if they're gained through corruption, through exploitation, other crimes. And the problem is set out at the beginning of Psalm 73. It's a psalm of Asaph. He was a founder of one of the temple choirs. Yes. Verse 1, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So Asaph, he's an Israelite in the time of David and Solomon, so about a, a thousand years BC, and he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God is good to Israel. And you notice there's a condition there to those who are pure in heart. And there's a reason for that, because the psalmist Asaph had been tempted to think that God doesn't care about those who are pure in heart. And the bad people, they get away with it. And in the dark valley of self-pity and doubt, the psalm writer begins to envy evildoers who are doing very well for themselves. Thank you very much. I don't know if the thought has ever crossed your mind I've been serving the Lord for decades, and now this happens. Is this all I get? Where were you? Lord, where are you now? It seems like you don't care about me or my family. or It, it sounds sacrilege to be thinking like that, but it has crossed people's minds. Maybe yours, maybe mine, but I'm frightened to admit it. But it certainly crossed Asaph's mind, the psalm writer of Psalm 73. And he bears his thoughts to us, but his inner thoughts. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold before I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So in this psalm now, he's starting his rant. He has a rant. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. There's no sickness for them, no problems there. Um, they're, they're free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. No stress for them. No, it's a dream run, not a care in the world. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. Superiority and threats stand over tactics. They win the day. They work. And therefore, um, pride is their, 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 their necklace, um, and uh, they clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity, and their evil imaginations have no limit. They're always up to no good. They, they, they scoff, they speak with malice, with arrogance, they threaten oppression, their mouths lay claim to heaven, their tongues take possession of the earth. The world is ours, and we will take what we want, and nobody's going to stop us. We're unstoppable, they boast. And therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. There can be an admiration for successful people, for a celebrity status, even if they're corrupt. They say, sorry, I've gone ahead of myself there. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? 
forget about God. He's a lost cause. We're the ones. We're the ones in charge. And then he sort of summarizes after his rant, Asaph writes, this is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. They're so successful. Sweatshops, human trafficking, organized crime, big fish drug dealers, um, the drug lords, um, the con artists, the scammers, the rich oppress the poor, the powerful oppress the vulnerable, the strong oppress the weak. And Asaph tells us about his self-pitying thoughts at the time. Surely, in vain, I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. He was on a slippery slope thinking that he'd wasted his life trying to live God's way, trying his best to live a pure and blameless life. It's all for nothing. Every day seems to bring more suffering and punishment for him. Has his quiet time, walks out the door and gets a slap in the face. So have you ever thought like that about your life? That it, it, it's not fear? Why, Lord? Why do some corrupt people seem to have so much fun, so much money, so much power, such a following, and get away with it? Why, Lord? And where has serving you got me? Where has serving you, Lord, got me? I'm sick, I've prayed, I'm sicker. I thought you loved me, I thought you cared. You don't even notice me. And you let the wicked, the cruel, the mean, the greedy, the heartless, the proud, the arrogant, get away with it. But wallowing in self-pity has shocked Asaph into a better frame of mind. He comes to his senses when he comes into the presence of God. There is a bigger picture, and he's thanking God that he didn't start teaching God's children that it's no use serving God, that you might as well join the corrupt and the callous. Now he's in the temple, in the presence of God, he's worshipping, and he's aware of other worshippers around him and he says if I had spoken out like that my, my inner thoughts I would have betrayed your children and, and a pause now for anybody who is involved in a teaching ministry please if you do find yourself feeling like that that it's all for nothing it's all a waste of time oh, why Lord you, you can't love me then Please, don't speak out and, 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 and spread that discouragement and despair to others. Go, go to prayer. Go to your Bible. Go to church. Draw near to God. See your pastor. See, see, see Lachlan or, or Dean and talk to them or a mentor. Get some sleep. But don't spread that. He was troubled. When I tried to understand this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. So he's there in, in, in the tabernacle. He's worshipping the other worshippers. And then, and then he, he, has, he sees their final destiny until I entered the sanctuary of God and I understood there these successful evildoers um, these men of the moment, he understands their final destiny. And light breaks in as he turns from self-pity to his God and worships. Um, the God who they despise has placed them on a slippery slippery slope on slippery ground you cast them down he's praying now Asaph is praying how suddenly they are destroyed completely swept away by terrors although it, it, it seems as though the world is theirs for the taking they are hurtling towards um, their destruction uh, they are like a, a dream and when one awakes oh when you arise Lord you will despise them as fantasies there is a bigger picture. There is God's justice. If not in this life, then for certain in the next, that bigger picture. The evildoers will have to give an account 
for their lives before Almighty God. In fact, we all will, which is a sobering thought. But on Judgment Day, in the heavenly courtroom, though we all fall short, I fall short, we all fall short of God's glory, though we are all guilty of sin, of rebellion or against our Heavenly Father, we have an advocate in that courtroom, Jesus Christ, who died in our place, and he is the perfect offering, the perfect atoning sacrifice for our sins. He paid the price. So if we have put our trust in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and declared not guilty. You can see the words there, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. But the evildoer, the ones who thumb their noses at God to their very last breath, for them it will not go well in that heavenly courtroom, and the verdict will be guilty. They might cry out to Jesus Christ then, to the Lord, save me. But if they didn't want to know him in this life, he will not know them in the next. Depart from me. I never knew you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. But in this life, it is still the day of salvation. There is still time for us all to repent and believe, to turn away from a fruitless way of life and, and put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ and to receive forgiveness, to receive the Holy Spirit, to be adopted as sons and daughters, to receive eternal life, abundant life, God's grace and mercy. So we pray and we plead for people to turn to God and be forgiven and to receive that wonderful, overflowing eternal life as a gift of his grace and mercy. And we must resist the temptation to envy those who do not have the burden of serving God, who didn't have to worry about getting up and going to church this morning. Think for a moment of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, that reading which Ray read to us from Matthew 26. Jesus gave himself up in obedience to the Father for our sake. He drank the cup of God's wrath that was for us to drink. He drank it so we will never have to. And he left us an example to follow, to keep on serving God with joy, to love others, to do good, to speak of Jesus, to reach others for Jesus. Maybe with our Jesus story. Psalm 73 ends with a word of open confession by Asaph. Verse 21, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. There's no self-justification here. There's no saying, oh, well, it, was a, it was an off day, oh, you'll understand. No, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. No self-justification. And then a word of trust, God's mercy and grace, not letting go of us when we turn away from him. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will take me into glory. Life everlasting with God. Don't look at these men of the moment. You... Whom have, this is an exquisite declaration of faith. Whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. None of those, those mansions or flashy gold-plated cars or extravagant lifestyles. No, no idols. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That is where he is putting his hope, his lot, his faith, his everything. Those, verse 27, those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of your deeds. So Asaph has moved from jealousy of the wicked and self-pity to worship 
and now to evangelism, now to wanting to tell, and in our terms, New Testament and beyond, to tell people about Jesus, a world that knows Jesus, and um, to tell maybe our Jesus story, the things that God has done. So Asaph has bared his soul, his sin, his confession, and his trust. Surely God is good. To, in, in his time, God is good to Israel, he, to those who are pure in heart. He, he's, he's gone through the dark valley. He's out the other side. God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And God is good. I mean, his mercy is, is, is to, available to all. He's good to those who are in Jesus, who trust him. So um, questions that we have about why did God allow that tragedy? Or why, Lord, did you allow that evil person to get away with it and keep on getting away with it? Cannot be solved with our narrow view of this earthly life. There is a bigger picture. And only from the vantage point of heaven will we see wrongs righted, evil avenged, and good upheld at the final judgment. In the meantime, we hang on to our faith in God. And if we doubt God's good character, remember that his character was perfectly revealed in Jesus. Hang on to Jesus. So please remember Psalm 73, that it's there. It can help you if doubt and self-pity and the why, why, why questions start to overwhelm. Or maybe keep it in your mind for, for others who are going through that or for yourself further along in your spiritual journey. Psalm 73, that's why it's there. I'll pray. Lord, help us to persevere in trusting in your goodness even when we don't understand why something awful or painful is happening. To know there is a bigger picture and you hold it. And to keep the faith, to hang on to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And now, could I ask you to um, stand to sing our next hymn, with heart, what a friend we have in Jesus.
Would you please be seated? The church family news. Oh, no, the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> and I've just asked you to sit down. I'm sorry. Please stay seated if you'd like or stand for the Creed. Thank you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker and heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I think it's safe. Church family news. So, moving along with some pace, I hope. Um, there's the uh, Connect card. So, you could scan that if you're a technical person and go straight to the form online, or there are forms near where you, on the table near where you came in. So, um, fill one of those in and put it in a special box that's um, there for the purpose. Moving along with the missionary, com the mis ministry commissioning service. So that's next Sunday. So um, from Lachlan, um, on the 28th of January, next Sunday, we'll be holding a ministry commissioning service at our final 9 a.m. combined service. This will be an opportunity to commission all the leaders of our various cathedral ministries for 2024, to commission Nathan Hiscock, our ministry apprentice for 2024-25, and to pray for our greater diocesan ministry. Before this 9 a.m. service, as you can see, at 7.30, 7.30 to 8.30, um, we're inviting everyone to join together in the cathedral uh, to pray for the various ministries. Then men's breakfast, um, that's coming up on the 10th of February at St. George's Bluff Point on Chapman Road, 7 a.m., then moving along to the newish lunch. And so that's a newish idea for newish people. So if you've been coming, uh, you, you, it's newish. So if you're new to the cathedral, or maybe have been coming along for up to a year, that's newish. Then uh, you are very warmly invited to um, a, a lunch at the, at the deanery next door here with Lachlan and Beck on the 11th of February. Um, and there is a pad of paper to write your name down for that. Yep. Okay, and then just an advance notice, sort of a, uh, a claim the date, sort of hold the date, a women's retreat, and that is on Saturday, the 24th of February. So that's coming up in, I don't know, five weeks' time or something like that. A women's re retreat, reflect and prepare. Now, um, on to our, our, our next slides. Um, last Sunday, uh, Nathan, our ministry apprentice, was introduced to Ross Cobb, the music director at St. Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney, and he was invited to observe um, while, while he was playing. And here he is. Here's Nathan. <laughs> so that's... That's what Nathan's been doing. So last week, Monday to Thursday, Nathan and Lachlan have been at the annual Apprentice Training Conference south of Sydney, and they both said they found it very worthwhile. Um, today, Sunday, uh, Nathan is invited, has been invited to speak at Callaroo Anglican Church in Perth about this, his ministry apprenticeship, and Callaroo has agreed to partner with the cathedral here in this training initiative of raising up local men and women to serve in local ministry and praising God for this. I think that's it. So I'm going to ask now if... John Tilliger would come forward. Thank you, John, to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Thank you. 
everyone. Please join with me in prayer. Lord God, the heavens declare your glory and creation makes known your power. You embody mercy and justice. You humble the proud and you lift up those who trust in you. What are we mere creatures that you are mindful for us? Yet you created life and have crowned us with glory through the work of your son. In you we live and move and have our being. You wisely rule over all our affairs. May we not take your father at your favour and your gloriousness for granted. Impress upon us a sense of awe through the power of your spirit. In all things be our comforter, our guide, our light. Father, hear our prayers. Father, although you are good beyond our understanding, we are quick to rebel against you. We often use the gifts you have given us against you, believing that we should rule our own lives in isolation from you. We pray that you'll move us by your spirit to a deep repentance and acknowledgement of our fallen state. May we dwell in your word so that we might remember your counsel and warnings. Help us to flee from sin so that we might glorify you. Bring us to true repent repentance so that we might become more like your son each day. Grant that through repentance, we may see more clearly the brightness and glory of the saving cross. Father, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that stem from the sacrificial death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Forgiveness, freedom, the enjoyment of your presence and eternal life to come. We thank you also for the gift of faithful ministers who proclaim your word. Give them wisdom and perseverance as they labour for the gospel and help us to follow their example in reaching Geraldton for you. We thank you for the gift of fellowship with one another and with you, and we ask that we will grow in love and service for one another. Father, we ask that you answer our prayers, using them for your glory and to further your kingdom. Help us to reach out to others with the gospel so that they might turn from their wickedness and live. We pray also for teachers and students returning to school, that they will adorn the gospel throughout the trials of school environments. We pray for an end to conflicts, and today we particularly pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Yemen, many of whom have been imprisoned and are now homeless. Help them to stand firm in the faith and deliver them from affliction. We pray for those in need, those who suffer, the sick in body or mind, the poor, the distressed, the lonely, the unloved, the persecuted, the unemployed, those who grieve and those who care for them. We pause now to bring before you those who are known to us. And Father, at this time, we particularly pray for Mike Wellham, who's unwell, and we ask that you'll give him a speedy recovery, and we thank you for Jeremy stepping in to fill a lot of gaps over the last few weeks. Comfort and heal, merciful Lord, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble. Give them a firm trust in your goodness. Help those who minister to them, and bring us all into the joy of your salvation. Heavenly Father, because of your saving love, we are always with you. You hold us in your hand. You guide us with your counsel. You have accomplished our glory so that we might live with you forever. And although our flesh and our heart may fail, may you be our strength and our portion forever. Help us all to tell of your wondrous deeds. Amen. And now please join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks for leading us in prayer. Um, our, our hymn now is entitled, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. So as we prepare to share in the, the Lord's Supper together and, and remember what Jesus has done for us, giving his body, his blood on the cross, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son 
to make a wretch his treasure. Please stand to sing. Ah, Thanksgiving prayer. I should look up that on a lot of levels. <laughs> A prayer, that the, if you'd like to give to the work of the Lord here, there is a sort of a, a locked box there just next to the font, right, like a little letter box. Um, so to give that way, thank you for those who give online. I'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we have gifts to share. Help us to be generous in supporting the work of the gospel and caring for those in need. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us. Praise him for his forgiveness. Please be seated. The Lord's Supper is an outward and visible sign of the grace shown to us in the death of our Saviour. As we share bread and wine together, we are invited to feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Knowing the goodness of God and the times we fail to respond with love and obedience, let us confess our sins together. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins 
and turn away from them for the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And a declaration of God's forgiveness, God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his Son, Jesus Christ, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. On the night before he betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, and again, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So come, let us eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. As, as you can see on the screens there, all who trust in Jesus as their Lord and Saviour are welcome to share in the Lord's Supper. Um, there is, the bread is gluten-free and there is a choice with the individual cups of wine or non-alcoholic juice. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave your life for us and we, we rejoice in the forgiveness that we have and the life that we have, that your resurrection is the promise of our own. So we thank you that we were, were able to come together as the body of Christ, as the people of God, of people who love you and uh, remember what you have, have done for us. And um, we ask these things, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And, and it is wonderful that we have assurance of eternal life, not because of our own efforts, which are so uncertain, but because of what Jesus has done for us. We have a blessed assurance. Shall, shall we sing, uh, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. If you're able, please stand for our closing hymn. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. Oh, no, the peace of God who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you, everybody, Rachel and the choir and all, all the people behind the scenes and back for um, uh, a, a, a special service. Uh, please stay for morning tea if you can or stay and talk in the cathedral. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.